What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the latest installment of Life After Strange, right here on Player One versus the World. I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming on none other than the Life is Strange BAFTA Award winning actor, everyone's favorite elder, Diaz brother, and it's none other than Gonzalo Martin. Gonzalo, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? Good. How about yourself? Oh, very good, very good. Thank you so much for coming on. I've been really excited to have this interview. I'm a big fan of your work as Sean and Life is Strange too, so it's just really good to have you here. Thank you so much. It means a lot. I'm very excited to be here as well. Oh, thank, fantastic. And I feel like for me, because we're recording this in 2020, and I think for me, the logical starting point is that we had Life is Strange 2 come out in 2018. All five episodes came out all the way through 2019. Then we fast forward to March of 2020 and uh, you get a BAFTA nomination. Then in April, you win the BAFTA. You're sitting here now, and I think for most of the guests that come on, they sometimes don't have that kind of like long stretch of life is strange connection. But for you, sitting there, what was it like to get the nomination and the win for Life is Strange 2? Um, honestly, it felt pretty amazing. Um, I mean, at first I knew, I knew that getting nominated was a, a possibility just because like ba um, BAFTA has a game category which the Oscars don't. So I didn't even, at first I didn't even know this. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, okay, this could, you know, this could be something. And then, but I didn't, you know, I didn't think that I was going to get nominated or anything until one day doing our, you know, doing one of our sessions, Phil like turns to me and he tells me like, um, this could be the biggest thing that you do in your career. And, um, you know, this, this could get you a BAFTA. And I was like, oh, okay, we're there. All right. Um, and then and then when I got nominated for it, I, I honestly couldn't believe it. I, it was already, you know, enough just getting nominated for it because it was, you know, a big dream of mine. But, but again, I, I still didn't fully believe that I would 100% win, win it because, because I knew that, that there were such other, like, huge actors – ahead of me that had done this like many times before and had been nominated many times before. And uh, just like, um, oh man, I'm terrible with names, <clears throat> but uh, his name, uh, the guy from The Walking Dead. Uh, Norman Reedus. Norman Reedus. Yeah. I love him. I freaking love him. Just like knowing that he was nominated as well. I was like, oh wow. You, you know, it feels amazing to be nominated with them. Um, but I also knew like, you know, I'm up against big actors that, you know, they might pick them because they're either better actors because they're made, they're all of, all of them are amazing or just because like, you know, they, they have a bigger following and maybe it's more convenient for them to, for them to win. But then in April when it, but then for a while I was like, no, if I really want, want to win it, that's when like, I really exercised my manif manifestation and, uh, and every day I would like wake up and uh, just be sure that on April 2nd, I was going to win the BAFTA. And, uh, and then April 2nd came and I was super nervous because I was like, okay, here we go. We'll see if manifestation is real or not. And like, and, uh, and I was watching it and I was watching it alone just because of how far, how afraid I was of like the result. Also COVID had just happened. So, you know, nobody could be at, at anybody's house. And, uh, and, and yeah, when I heard my name called out, I was like, holy shit, like it's, it's happening just like I, I manifested it, just like I've been like asking for it to happen, just, just everything happened as it had to, you know. Oh, congratulations as well. I, I, I was really thrilled for you to win that award um, and it was well deserved as well. And I loved your acceptance speech with the wolf howl as well at the beginning of it. It was all perfect for me. <laughs> um, Thank you. So as well as that, you, you touched on it then with manifestation. So whilst I was doing digging for this interview, um, I watched a couple of, um, I watched a video where you talked about manifestation and like how important it was. And um, you talked about that experience of when you moved from Argentina to the US, you left that life behind as a pilot, you um, wanted to become an actor. And then you talked about how um, you said to the, your family, like, you know, I have to win something in five years, otherwise it's just going to be worth for nothing. And you talked about your in-laws reaction, like that you were kind of like overreacting towards something like that. Have you had the chance to kind of like touch on this conversation with them or even like just talk to the family and what was their reaction like when, when you won this award? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell, I've told them uh, even when it happened, like when I got nominated, it was exactly five years since I moved from Argentina. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, this could be something real, you know. Um, but I stayed, I kept quiet until I fully won it. 
and once I won it, I was I went back to the family. And I was like, "Hey, guys, remember when you know when I said this, and all you guys made fun of me, and you know told me that I was overreacting and stuff." And they all just laughed, and and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, you were right." Um, but it's it's not something that like you know, um, it, 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 nobody had like any actual bad intentions when they were saying it to me. So it was just a matter of like, oh wow, like it actually did happen. Um, even though you just you were just like filling up your mouth with words when I was saying it, because I clearly had no idea how you know hard it is to to actually get there and climb in the industry. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. And before we move on from this as well, I'm going to pull you up on one thing. So you said that, um, you know, if your name was announced at the BAFTA, you said, and I quote, getting the wolves on permanent ink. Have you got that tattoo yet? Oh, I, I unfortunately have not. And I really want to. Um, I was planning a, a friend of mine who's a tattoo artist was coming over uh, to America before COVID happened. And, uh, and, and so I knew that like, you know, I, the only tattoo that I have under here is a tattoo that that person gave me as well. So I wanted to get it with them and then they couldn't come. But now I'm just like, I, it's been a really long time and, and I'm like, Oh, I should have gotten that tattoo. So I'm thinking I'm going to get it on the first year anniversary of the bath doing. Um, okay. Very fitting. Though, so so. April, April 2nd next year could be a possibility. Hopefully my friend is back and, and he can do it himself. Okay. Fantastic. Well, at least you're getting it. That's the main thing. Yeah, um, for sure. I'm getting it. I, I, keep, I keep my word. Fantastic. And you mentioned him before as well, and I always talk to all my actors who I bring on here about Philip Bach. And I'm not going to ask you about your experience because I know um, how much Philip Bach means to you from what I've read and how you've spoken about him. But with Philip Bach, I wanted to talk to you about, um, in your acceptance speech as well, and just in general, you've always said that Philip Bach pushed you, like really pushed you as in the role of Sean. Is there any like one memory that really stood out with Philip in the booth where he really pushed you to that point where you, <coughs> to the best part of your knowledge? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do remember um, the moment that I felt pushed the most was on episode one when we were just starting and I wasn't really good at, at voiceover acting. And, uh, and uh, you know, I also was pulling for my performance. I was pulling from places where I was getting away with certain stuff, but certain other stuff, he could tell that my performance wasn't being the best. And I think I've told this story before. You might you might know it already. Uh, but yeah, he basically told me that, you know, he challenged me to go to the streets to spend uh, spend uh, some time there during the day. Um, but I was just so tired of him telling me off and telling me that I was a, a little mama's boy who al- always got in everything. And so I... Uh, I took it to the next level and I, I decided to go sleep for in, at the, on the street for the weekend. And uh, I remember when I came back on the following Monday and I went back into the studio to record, I finally understood why he was saying all the things that he said. And when he like, we started recording and I got like one line after the other, five lines completely perfect on the first take. And he stopped the recording. He was like, well, what did you do th- different this time? And uh, it took me a while to actually convince him that I actually had gone to the street. Um, but once he did believe me and was realized that I wasn't lying, um, yeah, I, fe- I felt like I finally gained his respect. And I also started respecting him a lot more because I finally understood what he was talking about, about the, you know, the ways and the limits that you have to go to actually get the best performance that you can. Mm-hmm. And with Philip as well, um, I remember reading that under his recommendation, he told you to play the first Life is Stranger, like kind of watch through it, just to kind of get a feeling of the series. Um, what did you make of your experience when you did that, when you looked through the first Life is Stranger, bef- um, when you landed this role? So he, he recommended I play it because, again, we were doing episode one. I, I wasn't really getting the recordings that well. And so he recommended I play it so that I would get, you know, better at the specific AD, um, voiceover lines of like picking up a pencil and like looking at it, you know, stuff like that, that the, the player can like go around and, and check out everything. And so he recommended I play that. 
And I did, and it honestly did help a lot because um, I, I, I finally understood what he was looking for based on the first game. But I didn't connect the dots, and I didn't think, oh, I'm doing the second of this game. So I played the full first episode and second, and I was like, cool game, honestly. Um, but like then just had to go back to working and focusing on acting stuff, and that's why I couldn't finish it. Um, and I, I guess that it was similar to what we were doing, um, but I didn't actually know that we were working on Life is Strange 2 until like a month before it came out. Oh, amazing. So what, um, when you realized that you were working on it, and how big this game was. What was your reaction like with all the fans that was established with the series? Did it surprise you how big it actually was? Yeah, I honestly did, because I, I had no idea about the franchise, and had you know, once I learned, oh, this is the second game of a, a franchise that already exists, and like, not a, any franchise, but like a franchise that I apparently learned that is you know, huge, um, and has really hardcore fans, and, uh, and everybody loves like the first game. Also, it did get me worried because I was like, oh, man, we're doing the second game of a franchise that everybody already loves. Like, you know how hard that can, that can be, you know, topping a, a first movie, a first a first uh, show, a first game. Um, but uh, I, re I, I remember Phil saying, like, the, the stakes were already pretty high for this game because of the fandom. Um, and that's why every day in the sessions, like, we worked to get the best version possible because we knew the expectations were high. Okay, and we're speaking of the first game, but um, specifically, I know Philip was um, like your kind of go-to person in the booth. And from other actors, I've always heard that their experience, Michelle was there in some kind of capacity, whether whereas over a Skype call. I imagine he must have been there for yours um, whilst you were doing Sean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was pretty amazing to see Michelle quite a lot, if not through the whole, all the recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, because Michelle was in France and he would, you know, zoom in to every single session when in France it was like 4 a.m. And for us it was like, I don't know, 4 p.m. Um, but it was just such a big time difference that, you know, they were really troopers. Everybody who was on the other side of the line, they were at 4 a.m. up and just listening to my voice uh, and like hearing if they liked that take or not. And it was pretty impressive to see that that, that they were really listening and like really – giving notes of like, hey, let's try that line again. Or, you know what, that recording that we already did in the mocap, um, you know, it's looking like this, so why don't we try this again? It was pretty pretty amazing. And, and then when I finally got to meet them, when I went to PAX West, um, it was amazing. Honestly, Michelle is one, uh, an amazing person, as well as all the other creators, Raul, Michelle, um, Luke, everybody, really. Um, I had the best time whenever I would, like, go to events with them. Um, yeah, really, really amazing people. No, I'm really glad to hear that. I saw your photo with um, Luke, um, Raul, Michelle, um, all together when you took that photo, and Philip was there as well. Um, and Lucas subscribes to his channel as well, so I'm, I'm sure he'll definitely watch this interview, Gonzalo. So yeah. <laughs> I think awesome. you'll like to hear that. And again, with um, being in the studio, um, one of my favorite things I found out was that you improvised um, Inano, and it's such a fitting thing. And then even with the flexibility that they gave you with um, Sean, um, was that something that Philip suggested that you had a bit more flexibility with um, some of the lines to make them flow a bit more um, easy yeah. for Sean? Yeah, there were some lines, there were some Spanish lines that were written in a like very rustic Spanish, let's say. Um, and, uh, and Phil would check with me and the sound engineer who was from Mexico, I believe to like, see like, Hey, does this make sense? Does this sound good? Does this sound authentic? Um, but I can't remember what, what it was. Oh, I think it was the essay. Like, you know how, how, um, Mexican people will say essay. And I think we tried essay, but it didn't just, it didn't feel connected. It didn't feel with a lot of love. It didn't feel, it, it was missing a lot of things. And, uh, and so, you know, I remember just like looking up and, and saying, Hey, how about I say enano? I mean, I know it's not a Mexican saying, but it's definitely in Spanish and it means like little guy. And they're like, huh, no, no, I, I like that. Let's try it. And, uh, it stuck it worked and, uh, and they, they all really liked it. And apparently all the fans really did as well. No, I was a big fan as well. I thought it was very natural with the Diaz brothers, how they sounded. So I'm glad to hear that they gave you that flexibility. Yeah, um, I was happy to do so. And, you know, you kind of mentioned about that story that you had with Phil, um, you know, kind of uh, sleeping on the streets. But with your character, Sean, he endures so much um, 
pain and kind of all kinds of emotions throughout Life is Strange 2. But I'm just curious, was there any kind of scenes that you recorded in the booth which were really kind of like like hard hitting on you? Yeah, definitely. When when Esteban dies, that was like really hard uh, hard on me. Um, when when Sean has to sing, I mean, it, he doesn't have to sing, but you know, at episode four, I think yeah. it's like an option. And uh, recording the actual singing was also very hard. Um, episodes four ending was also hard to shoot, but m- mostly because of how physical it got. Um, but I would say definitely the hardest was episode five, just the, the saying the goodbye. Um, and, uh, yeah. And even, and it was also the hardest, not like, not only as in pain to like putting myself through that and, and thinking of that, but also like I had really done my work before that recording uh, that day. Cause I knew that this was, you know, the moment, the zine. And, uh, and I went in there and I was like giving some takes that were really good. Um, but Phil would tell me like, these are sounding too good. These are sounding like you rehearsed all night. And, and I wanted to sound like more raw, more authentic, more in the moment. Um, even if it sounds worse than what you're doing now, it's going to sound more real because it's sounding like it's coming up in the moment. Um, so it took us a while to record that. And he had me in that headspace of, of the end, which is a, a tough one for a really long time. So definitely that was also one of the hardest scenes to shoot. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll move out from the booth now and um, I'm going to take you to um, the life is strange to extra life charity stream. So in that um, you mentioned that um, you did a very few limited um, dual recording sessions with Roman George for the first Uh episode and um, there weren't as much, but did you two step back in the studio together for the remaining four episodes at any point? No, unfortunately not. And I think that's because we had basically very conflicting schedules. Um, he either had school and I think he lived far away. Um, it all, it's also harder to do a, a dual mic session because even though you do have that chemistry and uh, just everything there to work with, um, sometimes the actors may go at different paces or, you know, you may get the line of this actor, but not of this one um, or just technical issues. But I think it was mainly a, um, a scheduling thing that that's why they had us coming at different days, different times, every time. Right. Okay. And just speaking of Roman George as well, um, you know, you both deserve so much credit for when you see the scenes play out and how, um, how natural it sounds for the Diaz brothers almost to be like they're in the same recording booth. But I was just curious, what was it like to meet Roman George and um, what do you think of his performance as well? Oh, amazing. I, I freaking love Roman. I mean, he, um, and, and I remember like thinking back. So, so we, I only met him for the first time in the booth and when we were doing the sessions and he was way younger back then, just like I was. Um, and, uh, you know, we were kind of shy about it. We were both like doing this first job for the first time. Um, and I didn't get to see him again until like episode four or five when we started doing, like we went to PAX West, we went to, um, London to the Golden Joysticks and, and those events like that where I actually got to travel with him and like, you know, hang out, uh, go to different events, places, talk more. So that was pretty amazing because that's when I honestly felt like, oh, wow, we really are like Daniel and Sean, like we really are, you know, older brother and, and younger brother. Um, I remember we went skating to the skate park. Like I took him to the skate park that he wanted to go in London. And I was like, I don't know, man, I don't know anything about skating, but sure. Let's, let's go with you. I mean, let's, it's London. We're, we're here for one time. Um, but yeah, I freaking love Roman. He, he was amazing to work with, super talented. And, uh, and yeah, I hope I get to see him again in a, in another, um, like video game events, like, yeah, stuff like that. I'm glad to hear that. And um, with the Sean um, Daniel relationship, what did you make of that when you found out you were working on Life is Strange too, and just generally the story of these two brothers going down, um, you know, leaving their hometown, fleeing to their hometown of uh, Mexico? What, what did I make of it? Yeah, what well, was it just general impressions when you learned what Life is Strange 2 is about? I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it was pretty amazing to be involved in a project that was like... I don't know, like from, from the start, even before getting into the political matters, I was like, wow, we're, you know, we're two Mexican American kids 
something happens with the police and now we're like walking all the way down to Mexico in 2016 that mm -hmm. we, you know, it's, by, by then it was Trump land. And, uh, and so I already was impressed by the game's, you know, willingness to touch those subjects and tell those stories. And then the more that we did the game, the more episodes in, I realized that it just got more and more political. And, uh, and I was like, I don't know, kind of, kind of proud um, to be, to be a part of a game that doesn't shy away from, from those subjects, which I feel like are important to talk about. And I think it's cool that we finally have um, a style of video games <clears throat> for this platform to also be a place where we can, you know, uh, become, become more aware of, of what, what life is and, and where we're living and all that and what are the good things and the bad things that need, need to be changed. Fantastic. We'll come on to the political stuff in a little bit. I'll just bring that up later on. But um, just sticking with Daniel as well, obviously, I think one, one of the cool things with Daniel was, was the power. Everyone saw it. It was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, what was your reaction like when you learned that Daniel had the power? I honestly, at first I was like, wait, so he got the power, but this is Life is Strange. So, you know, eventually I'm going to get some powers, right? And, and they were like, yeah, we don't know about that yet. And, uh, and it was like, oh, okay. They also still didn't know if the player was actually going to get to play Daniel or if, or if they're only going to get to play Sean. So I was like, oh, man, well, I don't, have, I don't have the power, but I do have, like, the character that has all the, like, backstory and, and has to take the story forward because – He's the older brother and has to train the little guy into, you know, controlling his powers. Um, and I do remember getting excited in, I think it's episode two or three, when Sean tries to, like, have one of those powers. Um, and he fails. And honestly, it just broke my heart. I, and, and as a person and as an actor, um, just seeing that, recording that, it wasn't, it wasn't much because, like, there's no lines in it, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I actually got to see it, I, I felt heartbroken, like for Sean, for myself as an actor, just like, like as, as if I had lived that, like, man, I was so expecting to get powers and, and it seems like I'm just not that special, you know? Um, no, I felt for you in that scene as well. I really enjoyed that scene where he, he kind of like reaches out and, um, feels like he wants our powers, but he doesn't have it. And yeah. it did, it, it pulled on my heartstrings a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's just take Sean. Let's take Sean away from Daniel for the moment, and let's move on to um, Sean and Lila. So, like, I know a lot of people love that kind of chemistry that Sean and Lila had in the first episode. We saw them interact, but then after the first episode, it kind of disappeared a little bit. Like, Lila became like a really, really secondary character and was fizzled into the background. That story developed over the over the course of the game, and I know some fans were disappointed with that. Were you a little bit disappointed that Lila and Sean didn't have a bit more of a close relationship, or like she didn't come and chase after him in the game? Yeah, to be honest, I, I, I was expecting, especially because episode one starts so, you know, so hard on their relationship and their friendship. Um, I was expecting to see more of her and like, you know, maybe she came with us or we found her on episode three. Um, but at the same time, I feel like the creators of the game did an amazing job at, at keeping this, this story as real as possible. So I really did appreciate on episode, I think it's the end of episode one or maybe episode two. Um, when, uh, no, it's an end of episode one that he inform, informs her of where she is. But you can also not call her. But anyways, I remember there being the possibility that if you do call her, she does stay more, a little bit more involved, meaning at the end on episode five, depending on the choices that you make, um, there's a possibility of seeing Lila again, which I really uh, appreciate it. But yeah, I was expecting to have more of a, a relationship there, um, especially because like you could tell they were best friends and that, you know, could there be something more in there? But I think they, they managed to do a really good job and like, also giving us Finn and Cassidy as the actual interest option and how sometimes life just, just doesn't go the way that we planned. And yeah, we were all expecting for it to be Sean and Lila, but just because of life and how life takes the places that life takes to you, you know, you, you ended up in a weed farm where there's these two other characters that, that you might be interested in. Um, but yeah, to, to be honest, I, I was expecting more and I think that's why 
I really appreciated and enjoyed producing the the film that I just finished producing called Back to Lila, which will be coming out soon. And I remember when I first met the author and he like told me like, okay, the movie that I want to do is called Back to Lila. And I was like, what? I, I, we were already working on the game and I already knew that like fans wanted more of, of Lila and, and I even wanted more of Lila. And uh, the movie has nothing to do and it's not connected to the game at all. But I, I, it was ironic and quite like crazy for me to see that the, that the title was so connected to, to the game that I was working on at the moment. Um, so again, the movie is nothing like the game and nothing related to, but the main character or the love interest is Lila. And if you guys are looking to see Sean go back to a Lila, uh, you can go back, you can go and, and watch back to Lila. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Completely fine with that plug as well. That's com- I'm going to watch the film, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? I like the fact that you touched on Finn and Cassidy, because when we get to episode three in Wasteland, um, you see that fact that they give you the option to choose a love interest and also kind of confirm that Sean is an L- LGBT character in the game. There's so many of them as well. Um, I have two questions in this. Which did you pick of putting Sean with Cassidy or Finn? And what did you make of the fact that Sean's uh, sexuality was opened up in that way in that episode? I thought it was pretty cool, um, and I wasn't expecting it, not even when I was recording, but I thought it was pretty cool that that they gave the option, you know, because usually, yeah, and even in games where where you get to make, you know, make your choices, sometimes they'll just even enforce certain choices or, you know, story plots or storylines upon you. So when we first recorded the Cassidy one, I was like, oh, okay, he he kind of ends up with Cassidy, and, you know, we have the the option of him going after Cassidy or maybe not going after Cassidy at all. And, you know, okay, that's cool. But then when like a couple days later, we recorded the Finn option, I was like, Oh, this is not for Cassidy. Oh, wow. That's, that's cool. So like, it's, it's really cool because it's really going to allow the audience, no matter who's playing is no matter who it is to actually make their own choosing of, of, of who they actually want to, you know, get in a relationship with or get involved with. And I thought it was pretty cool. Cause again, it's, it's the first time that I've seen video games or a video game do it. And, uh, and I thought it was pretty, pretty amazing that like they, it's, it's, it's a place where no matter who's playing it, we'll get the option or the possibility to feel represented and recognized, you know? Fantastic. And so when we move further down the line with Life is Strange 2, um, I found that was a very interesting dynamic. So we have that relationship with Sean and Daniel, the main part of the story, but then we also see the introduction of Sean and Daniel's mother, and especially in physical form, Karen comes into the story. And when I was watching that, there was a lot of emotionally charged scenes between Sean and Karen. Um, what did you make of the kind of dynamic where they brought Karen into the story? And then also, what was it like to record those scenes that were like really quite touching for Sean and Karen? Yeah, definitely. It was it was another challenge, just like the S2 ones. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge because it's not. It wasn't only about like losing a father when 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 it happens on episode one, but it's actually regaining a parent or a mother that you grew up with and abandoned you, and then now she's back when you need her the most. But you know, you want to be with her and you want to have her hold you, but at the same time, it's like, wait a minute you abandoned me. So, so many different emotions and things that like, yeah, I, I honestly had to like really process it and a lot in order to just, just make the performance as good as possible. Um, because honestly, poor, poor Sean and Daniel, it's quite horrifying everything that they've been through, not only throughout the game, but like in their past story, in their past life, uh, not life, but like before, before we come into the story as an audience, the fact that they lost their mother and everything. I don't know. I, I felt really bad for Sean and uh, I, I try to do my best to bring his, you know, bring his, his truth and his story to life in terms of how we, how would he have felt regarding Karen, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Fantastic. And I have to ask what is Gonzalo's favorite scene from life is strange too. And why? Oof. Uh, I would have to say between the ending of four and the ending of five. Because the ending of four, I don't know. I just love seeing Sean get, you know, standing up time after time, even though he gets beaten down. Um, it's just a, it's such an exhilarating scene to watch, especially when I watch uh, playthroughs. 
because I, I, I haven't played the full game myself, uh, not yet, but um, when I watch playthroughs, I enjoy it so much because it's such a thrilling scene where everybody's like at the edge of their seat and, and I love seeing how people react to it. It's like, come on, stand, you know, listen to me. Um, but then e episode five, the ending of that, honestly, just, you know, breaks my heart every time that I, that I watch it. I feel like I relive the experience every time that I see it play through. And, uh, and I think it's a, it's a really, you know, beautiful and honest, truthful goodbye, um, to, to the story of these two brothers, no matter the choice that you make, like the fact that just Sean is apologizing for everything, all of his mistakes that, that he's done so far. I felt it was very relatable and, and uh, yeah, I really enjoy that scene. Fantastic. And with episode five, let's just keep on it for a moment. So um, there's so many multiple endings from that as well, which includes one where Sean dies as well. What was your reaction like when you found out there was so many endings for episode five? And was there any particular one that stood out for you, which you liked the most? Uh, I remember when I found out that there was going to be five endings, I was like, wow, not two, but five. Uh, that's cool. Um, and then recording each one of them. It, it, the thing is, all five endings don't really have lines. So it's not like I had to record them. I, I, I had to do some, just like the, the pre-story, just right before they, they, you know, they face off the cops. Um, so I didn't actually get to see the, the, the endings until right before episode five came out. And, uh, and I was in London with them and they were like, do you want to see the endings? And oh my God, that was, yeah, I cried so much in that office because like, it was the first time that I was seeing the ending to our own story, to my story, to what I feel felt like I had lived through. And I was like, oh, I finally get the closing point. Okay. And then they showed me all five different endings. And I'm like, I don't know if I like any of these, you know, like all of them have such a sad and like tough part to them. Like even, even the happiest of endings, which would be like them in Puerto Lobos, because like that's what they were aiming at. Like still, like you know, you see, uh, you see Sean with the uh, with the black eye, um, which like the the developers explained to me, like the black eye is because he he he's a bad you know influence or not a bad influence, but he became a, a bad a dark or a darker whatever. And then the white eye when he comes out of prison is because he he chose the pathness of good. Um, and so just even, even seeing them together, it was tough because like, sure, they're together, but like they, li they live this life kind of on the slumps. Sure, they're packed with stolen money, but it's not like they can go and like really use it. So they like live in the garage. There's co guys coming after them that they have to like, you know, uh, strangle them with, their, with Daniel's power, which again was pretty cool because it was like, yeah, the, bro the brothers are still united and like, you know, until the end but still like i don't know all of the endings were really tough to watch and, and think at how crazy and tough the life endings can be you know i'm really glad to hear that and i'll give you a bit of a breather from sean because the next question we move away from him and is there any other characters that you like from life is strange too particularly and why yeah i really enjoyed brody um Brody was definitely a character that i was like oh i you know as a person myself i'm like oh that that's a cool guy just, you know, driving along the coast and uh, from place to place writing. And honestly, it, and the fact that he helps, you know, Sean and Daniel and, you know, it's a, a good influence on Sean and trying to like guide him. Honestly, I, I really vibe with Brody. Okay. I, I like Brody as well. Um, so it's a good choice. Um, so let's go back to Sean for a second. So this is one of my favorite questions to ask is what is your favorite thing about Sean and why? And is there anything with Sean that you wish that the developers had focused on a little bit more? Hmm. I think my favorite thing about Sean was how invested he was as an older brother and how worried he was of Daniel's well-being. And uh, I think I pulled a lot from my own older brother. Um, and so I felt like I really liked the possibility of of actually feeling like my older brother might have felt 
when I was younger and he, when he was like taking over me. And so I feel like a lot of the chemistry also came from there, just thinking about how it was for me growing up. Um, and uh, that's, that's definitely like very relatable how much care Sean had for his little brother. That's, that's one of the things that I, that I liked a lot about it. And, uh, and one of the things that I, I, I hope they would like maybe explore more was, well, uh, I already said like the Lila relationship, but again, life takes you through different paths. But I think, I don't know, maybe as an actor, as a performer, I was expecting to explore more the possibility of Sean having powers. But I mean, we explored it, you know, we, we do see that he doesn't have them. Um, so I don't think there's anything actually bad with Sean's storyline that I feel like, you know, they, they missed really touching on. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, I have to bring this up because you're a dog person. I found that out. So it must have been a very gut wrenching moment when you saw what happened to Mushroom in Life is Strange 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, honestly, that was, oh, I, that was another thing that I was like, damn, this game is like not afraid of anything. Because even like, you know, when, when it gives you the option of killing it or not, I was, I, I remember I was like, kill it, kill it. <laughs> um, but then, then it makes you think like, oh, no, you know, it's, it's just an animal, just a bigger animal, part of the chain, part of the cycle, the system that like, you know, he saw a smaller animal and just hunted him so it's not really right to do it but at the same time it's like you ate my dog you know so um but yeah it was it was a heart-wrenching moment and seeing daniel's reaction and and even when the 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 puma like takes it away um it's like oh and we don't even get a funeral damn (laughs) yeah no it was it was brutal. I think the, the community is still mourning that. It's especially the fact that the Puma just walks away with it. It's like, hang on a minute, like, at least get the body back and like, give it a burial. Right, um, yeah. No, but okay. So like, my, as obviously I love um, your performance in the game, but for me, one of my personal highlights was when um, they brought you in to do the live action trailer at the Free Seals um, uh, Motel, the recreating of that scene. And um, what was it like when they approached you to do that um, trailer and the opportunity to live out Life is Strange 2 in a live action capacity? Funny story. I mean, I actually really enjoyed shooting the trailer and it felt amazing because they're like, oh man, we're finally doing, you know, the game in person and this is so cool. But uh, I also had to work for it a lot, work really hard because they didn't approach me. It's not like they were like, oh, you play Sean, uh, Sean Diaz in Life is Strange 2. Please come. We're doing this live action. Oh, no. Um, they were casting completely different people until I found out that they were cat. Like I read the breakdown and I was like, wait a minute. This seems oddly familiar. Like this seems like like my game but are they doing a live action and so i called my my people and i told them like hey find out if there's an audition and everything and they they called casting and the casting had pretty much already closed and without seeing me and and we called back saying like are you kidding me give me one chance of like just doing it because i'm the guy you know i'm the guy on on the game like so give me a chance to be in in real person and so they were like oh okay you're you're the the guy we don't know what that means but sure come in and i went in and they were like so what do you mean you're the guy i'm like i'm the guy who voices the freaking kid in the thing and they're like okay okay all right let's see you do it and so i did it and because i had already done a couple of episodes and i really knew sean's you know character sean's sean's story I booked it pretty much right away. I actually had to go back for another callback and I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, and in the callback, they asked me if I would cut my hair down because I already had it pretty long. And I said that, oh, yeah, yeah, because I wanted to book it. But then when they, I, they booked me, I was like, yeah, I don't want to cut my hair for this. And so we did the whole hiding it with the beanie and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember that, that it was very exciting to be a part of it, but it, it, I almost wasn't, you know, because I, I had to go in and audition and re-get the part that was already mine. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very surprised to hear that because when I was digging through, I was like, they must have approached him and done this because it was like a cool nod to it, but I did not realize that you had to re-audition for that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I remember like it was the, the weirdest week of auditions for me. I was like, I'm, I'm going back to this callback where – where I am already the guy, but they're not giving it to me, you know? (laughs) 
Oh, well, either way, I, I loved it and I lo- know a lot of fans liked it, so I'm really glad that you actually did it in the end. Um, uh-huh. No worries. And, and I think like for me as well, I was doing a lot of snooping again for your Instagram and I saw that you posted the folder um, with the news that you'd got a green card. Massive congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. No, of course. And I bring that up because um, in the context of things, you, you know, you wanted to be a pilot, then you didn't take that path. Then you left Argentina, you moved to the US, pursued a career in acting. What was it like that moment when you got that green card and just the feeling of knowing that you were part of the US, you, you know, you live in the US now? Pretty amazing. Honestly, like, um, like you said, I, at first I was set to come to the US to, to, to be a pilot um, I still am a pilot. I still got my license and, and, and uh, I actually renewed it here once I had more time after acting, after acting school. Um, so I still go flying every now and then, but, but yeah, just um, the fact that I finally feel like I've, I've finished climbing through the immigration ladder uh, feels very relieving um, because yeah, it means that I can stay here forever just doing what I love. And I've worked five years, I've worked really hard for these last five years to get through all the hoops and jumps of immigration and climb up that ladder and finally just be able to beat the system and just stay here forever. So it honestly means a lot. And thank you for, for um, mentioning it. Yeah, it's, it feels amazing. Thank you for, for your congratulations. No, of course. And I bring that up because with, you know, when we're at now, two years on from Life is Strange, and I think maybe this episode might go a bit later, but two years on from Life is Strange, um, that game touched on police misconduct and then brutality. Then we had the Black Lives Matter movement that happened. Um, We now have Donald Trump leaving office and, you know, that entire symbolism of the wall. Um, You know, so much has happened in this. And when I bring up all those subjects, what was it like for you just kind of sitting here now two years on thinking I was working on such a project that touched on so many of these kind of themes that are so relevant? I, like I said, I feel, I feel very honored and very proud to actually be involved in a project like Life is Strange that doesn't shy out from uh, touching these subjects. Um, But I feel like what rewards me the most is when I get messages from fans basically saying that how the game really changed their perspective on these matters um, and that they had never, you know, thought of it that way or, or, you know, even even thought of it. And and now the the game made them wake up to, you know, reality and, and what's good and what's not. And so that, that in, in it in itself is just already fulfilling enough to know like, oh, wow, you know, the game, the political, politically charged game that we were doing, you know, it's, it's changed the perspective of a lot of people. I don't know if tons of people, I know it if like really a lot, a lot of people, but just the amount of messages that I get of people saying like, wow, it really did change the way that I see things is fulfilling enough. Um, I wish that, you know, more people would give video games a chance and, uh, you know, could possibly play this game and, and also uh, change their perspective on certain stuff. Um, but I mean, everybody has their different media. There's mm-hmm. TV, there's, there's movies, there's games, and all of them, you know, can change people's minds and perspectives. So as long as, the, as long as stories like Life is Strange keep coming out and not only on gaming platforms, but, you know, other platforms as well, like TV and, and film, I think, I think that that's a good path. Amazing. And before we move on from Life is Strange as well, just one thing you touched on there, you said that fans talked to you about the importance of this game, that they kind of like resonated with all these kind of themes. And when I was snooping through all your social media profiles, by the way, um, I saw that you still, um, you know, you repost stuff from Life is Strange, fans that are like their first playthroughs of Life is Strange, like the reactions and that kind of engagement of the community, you've never been shy to kind of stay away from where you worked on Life is Strange too. What's it like just that kind of interaction level still being there two years on from Life is Strange? It honestly feels amazing. I mean, I, I'm surprised that, you know, fans are still super hardcore on the game even two years after it finished. Um, I, uh, I, I like the community and I like the, the, the um, fans of the game. I always try to keep a 
space open for them in my platform. Um, I like to promote other people and whenever I see like an amazing fan art, I like to promote that artist or even a YouTuber doing their stream for the first time or stuff like that, um, that I find, you know, I find uh, our reaction of them amusing. I love to like just post and, and keep, keep that alive, um, not only for the fans, but also for myself, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. Life is Strange is definitely one of the greatest and biggest projects that I've ever been a part of. And it's really have gotten me my the following that I have today. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for, for all of the fans who, who've played and have given the game a chance, have given me a chance. And, uh, and basically, you know, they're, they're here to, till today. I'm really glad to hear that. And I'll give you a bit of a break from Life is Strange because we'll move out of it. Um, so just generally, what's life been like after Life is Strange? And has there been any kind of like favorite projects that you've worked on post Life is Strange? Um, so after Life is Strange, unfortunately, COVID happened. So I was expecting to like work, you know, start working a lot more after Life is Strange, especially after the BAFTA. But like I said, COVID happened and, uh, you know, nothing really happened. We'll see what happens next year. Hopefully I can, I can book more stuff. I'd love to book another game um, or, or more voiceover work. Um, however, it has given me the, the time and opportunity to work on, on my own film back to Lila. Um, so, you know, everything happens for a reason, but I, I, I am, I'm excited to keep on doing video games and keep on just working more and more opportunities um, out of, out of, life is strange and out of the BAFTA. Of course. And um, that part prior to COVID as well, um, you know, between life is strange and uh, COVID really kind of like hitting its stride now, um, you know, you're in a strong position with your BAFTA when your performance life is strange too. Did you apply for any gaming roles in between that period or did anything come up? Um, not really. I mean, there's voiceover auditions that come up, but um, you know, I don't know, my, my agents and my manager was, were the ones who like would get me those opportunities. I, I don't even know where to apply for, for a gaming opportunity job. I'd love to know that way I can like apply for more, but yeah. Um, but yeah, a few, a few game opportunities did come up, but you know, I didn't book them and it doesn't mean anything. Um, most, most jobs you don't really book. <laughs> But, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what other opportunities come. Okay. And I have to ask this as well. Who would Gonzalo's dream actor to work with be and why? Hmm. That's a really difficult one. You can't just say Roman George as well and cheat your way out of this. Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, no, I mean, I think if I want to stay out of, of the cliche, which of course would be DiCaprio, I think one of the other amazing actors that I love to act with would be Tom Hanks. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But there's just so many other amazing actors that I'd love to work with. It'd be amazing. Well, you never know, because if they do Catch Me If You Can too, and they get rid of Leonardo DiCaprio, they can bring you in to, put, <laughs> to that see be, what's that going on. That would be a, a great bargain. <laughs> <laughs> there we go and uh, Gonzalo before we like, kind of wrap up and ask you more of a question I know a lot of people that watch the show um, have been really touched by Life is Strange 2 and kind of want to and Life is Strange 2 Life is Strange 1 they kind of want to become actors and I love that your journey the way it kind of panned out um, what kind of advice would you give to like a young aspiring actor if they wanted to get into VO work or just generally into acting I would definitely say get training um you know, training is very important. A lot of people think that acting is just, oh, I go and act and that's it. And it really isn't. So make sure you get training. Um, but what I wanted my like main advice to be, or what it honestly has been this last couple of days that I've been doing interviews um, and that I realized myself, it's really the best piece of advice that, that you can give anyone, especially anyone that's coming to this industry. Other than getting training, um, and never giving up and all, all the other cliches. My main advice would be get yourself a great group of friends that you can rely on, a great group of friends that you can count on. And, and when I say group, it doesn't even have to be more than one or more than two or three or four people, but just a group of people that you can, you know that you can count on them, you know that you can go back, uh, you know, and cry with them if, 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 a job opportunity didn't show up, if the audition didn't go well, if you're feeling stuck, if, if anything, if you're homesick or whatever, 
you know, have that, have that base, have that, that net of support. Um, Cause it's really the most important thing other than like getting the training while you get your training, you know, it's super easy to fall into just depression or being sad or feeling sad about yourself or something or wanting to go back home, stuff like that. And uh, those are battles that are really, really hard to win by yourself. And if you don't have a great net of support, um, that'll, you know, be there for you and tell you, don't think that way. You know, it happens to everybody. You know, we, we all had bad, bad auditions and stuff like that. It's a tough industry to go through. So definitely make sure that you're supported in all senses. I mean, that'll be very valuable advice and thank you for sharing that as well. Um, so whilst we move on to the next question, there's a plans for a Life is Strange TV show. While I know that you would love to play Sean, and obviously you did with the, <laughs> the live action trailer, you're not allowed to in my show. So instead we're putting <laughs> Gonzalo in the role of the casting director. Who would you cast to play Sean and why? Who would I cast to play Sean and why? Hmm. Um, well, I'm not that familiar with like young actors' names, but I would say uh, in terms of looking like him, and uh, and most probably most definitely achieving an, an, a great performance i would cast uh one of my closest friends his name is orlando um orlando pineda and he's an amazing actor and he looks a lot like sean um we actually had the same type of look before before i started growing out the hair mm-hmm. um and yeah he looks very much like sean as well He's also Latin. He, uh, he's an amazing actor as well. So I think he would definitely, you know, go the distance with, with performing him. But of course, I would rather perform him myself. Of course. <laughs> of course. No, good choice. And I like the fact, you know, it's a close friend who can obviously share experience from you if you had to do that. But we all know that Gonzalo has to play Sean. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, Gonzalo, we're at the end of the show. I always let my guests take the kind of final say here and kind of send a message to the Life is Strange community. So I'll let you take it away from here. Okay, wow, thank you. Um, I guess I, what, what I would love to say to the entire community, like, like I always do, is, is thank you for, for believing in us, all the creators and you know, makers of, of Life is Strange too. Uh, thank you for giving us a chance and thank you for giving our story and this story a chance. Um, personally, thank you for giving me a chance as an actor, um, up and coming. This is the, was the first time that I was ever doing voiceover and all of your love and support really meant a lot through each episode coming out. Um, and I worked and I did my best to try and bring his, you know, Sean's story to life. And, uh, and I'm so happy that a lot of you are very excited and happy about how that turned out and that this story meant a lot to many, many people. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just thank you for all of your support and, uh, in terms of, of you guys and, uh, you know, advice for, for you wanting to, to do this as well. Like I said, get training, um, find out where, where games are made. You know, a lot of them are made here in LA, but there's many games made in Germany, many made in France, a bunch of different places. So find out if locally, wherever you're at, you know, they, they're doing it or where's the closest place, get your training, get your net of support and get out there and, and, and never give up. Manifest it just like I did. Um, I had never planned on working on video games. I simply said in five years, I want to be having my own BAFTA nomin, you know, big award nomination and prize. And I had no idea what it was going to be, but I worked very hard towards it. Um, and that's why, what I recommend you do. Um, but most importantly, get that group of friends that is going to be there for you. Thank you for a very wonderful message. And guys, I hope you all enjoyed the episode. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to Gonzalo. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, um, subscribe, comment. It really does help with the channel. Gonzalo, absolute privilege to speak to you. Again, really humbled by it. Um, and I hope we see you more and more games down the line. Maybe Life is Strange Free never know who knows hopefully (laughs) hopefully (laughs) thank you so much Um, for having me i had a blast no no of course i'm absolutely humbled to um, have you on i want to speak to you for a long time so i'm glad that we actually got to do this interview Um, fantastic and guys stay tuned there'll be more episodes to come i had a wonderful guest on today hopefully many more um so stick around there's more life strange content to come see you later guys see you later guys